Good day to everyone. Welcome to another episode of the BHP, the Bible History Project, the Bible study program brought to you by the Assembly of Yahushua. Our topic for today is living with the enemy. We will study 1 Samuel chapter 27. Now, before we go ahead and proceed, let us first offer this prayer of thanksgiving. Merciful and loving Father Yahuwah, thank you so much for blessing your people. You guide and protect us every day. You are faithful to your promises, and you are one whom we can rely on day by day in our life. You are our shelter and our refuge, our rock who is stable and who will bless each and every one of us. May you please be with us in this study of your holy words, that by the power of your teachings, we can always be strengthened. Yahushua, may you please increase our faith, manifest yourself, manifest your life in our hearts, that we may become more and more like you each and every day. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. We ask everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters in the faith, we are truly happy to have you join us in this Bible study. As you know, the VHP is all about studying the history of the people of God because we can, when we look back and examine how the servants of God, especially those who are notable for their faith, so that we can learn principles in their life and in their relationship with Yahuwah Abba. And so our topic today is living with the enemy. It's all about what happened to David. So today we're going to examine a part of David's life, which he probably is not very proud of, because we can we will see how he descends and spirals towards a decline and deterioration of his faith. And so how did this begin? Let's begin our studies in the book of First Samuel, chapter 27, and the verses 1. But David kept thinking to himself, Someday Saul is going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape to the Philistines. Then Saul will stop hunting for hunting for me in Israelite territory, and I will finally be saved. So here's David. He's thinking to himself, and he begins to think of a radical plan, a plan that is not the will of Yahuwah. What is this plan? He's going to escape to the Philistines which is enemy territory. Take note, the Philistines were the arch nemesis of Israel and the arch nemesis of Yahuwah himself. So it would not be the will of God for David and his men to dwell in enemy territory. But this is what was contemplated by David. He kept thinking to himself, someday Saul is going to get me. And so his solution, not Yahuwah's solution, but his solution is to go to Philistine territory. Take note, he began to think this way because on numerous occasions, he fled uh, Saul and his army who continued to hunt him down again and again and again. And after a while of living outside of your comfort zone and from cave to cave, running away from people who want you dead, you're going to be exhausted physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And when a person is exhausted physically, emotionally, and spiritually, he will begin to think himself or think and say to himself things like, someday Saul is going to get me. And so we can see here that David was suffering from discouragement. Now, all of us go through episodes and periods of great discouragement in our life when we're frustrated when we expect something to be done, it doesn't go our way. And so when you lose a job or you're expecting some kind of promotion, it doesn't happen. We become discouraged. And when a person is discouraged, it is a dangerous thing because it opens up pathways to sin, to spiritual decline. Look to David. Because of his discouragement, what does he decide to do? Let's keep reading. Two down to three. So David took his 600 men and went over and joined Ashish, son of Maoch, the king of Gath. David and his men and their family settled there with Akish at Gath. David brought his two wives along with him, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, Nabal's widow from Carmel. And so in 
this state of discouragement, what does David decide to do? He decides he's going to take his 600 men and they will settle, not just visit, but settle with Ashish at Gath. Ashish is the king of Gath. He is in Philistine territory, and we know the Philistines are the enemies of God. So this was a desperate decision because they went, David went from living within the confines of Israel to going beyond its boundaries and living with the Philistines. So this was a desperate action, and we know it was the result of his discouragement. And so when a person is discouraged and he or she does not attend to that discouragement, it could lead to desperate actions. And the people who are affected the most when we take desperate actions are the people we love, the family. Because it wasn't just David. It wasn't just his 600 men, but their families as well, including David's wives, Ahinoam and Abigail. So David shifted from trusting Yahuwah to seeking protection from the Philistines. He trusted in the solutions that he comes up with instead of the solution that Yahuwah provides for him. So he became desperate, and desperate actions oftentimes affect family members. Take note, he joins Ashish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. And when we think of Ashish and Gath, it should spark a memory because this is not the first time this has happened because this happened before. If you go back to 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 15, David left fleeing from Saul and went to King Ashish of Gath. And so before, as a result of Saul hunting down David, David already thought about going to the refuge there. And so he meets with King Ashish of Gath the king's officials said to Ashish, isn't this David the king of his country? This is the man about whom the women sang as they danced. Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. Their words made a deep impression on David, and he became very much afraid of King Ashish. So whenever they were around, David pretended to be insane and acted like a madman when they tried to restrain him. He would scribble on the city gates and dribble down his beard. So she said to the officials, look, the man is mad. Why did you bring him to me? Haven't I got enough madmen already? Why bring another one to annoy me with his daft actions right here in my own house? And so if you still remember, there was a time when David also became desperate, right? And to find refuge, because he was being hunted by Saul and his men, he flees to Gath and seek protection from King Hashish. But we know what happened there. Yahuwah intervened, and because of his intervention, the people re realized that, uh, that uh, David, uh, the, the, the officials of Hashish, were complaining about David and saying and convincing Hashish that this is David, the one of whom the Israelites are so proud of and consider as their champion. And they even made a song about him. And so when David realized what was happening, he began to pretend that he was insane. He acted like a madman, not exactly uh, the, the best times of David. So in David's despair, he goes back to a familiar road of sin. Doesn't this, doesn't this happen a lot, you know, when you feel down and discouraged? The tendency is you kind of repeat or go back to what you did in the past. You go back to a path of destruction, to a path of sin. This is what happened to David. And the motivation behind David's decision and desperate action is because Saul was an enemy. Ashish was the enemy of Saul. And so we realize, well, David and, and Ashish, well, they share the same enemy. I mean, have you heard before the following saying, the enemy, my enemy is my friend? Now, do you think this is a valid excuse to side with the enemy? Absolutely not. Because the enemy of Yahuwah is your enemy no matter what. And so we should never say, side with the enemy. We should never take the path towards destruction. However, 
You know, David, well, not only did he go and live with the enemy, he settled there for quite some time. Why? Well, what happened after he goes to Gath and meant with the Philistine king? Let's read 27 verse 4. Word soon reached Saul that David had fled to Gath. So he stopped hunting for him. Mission accomplished. David was living in peace. Saul was no longer hunting him. And so because Saul stopped hunting David, David began to believe he was on the right path. Sometimes people think when they're not experiencing any kind of trouble, they're on the right path. I'm in peace, therefore there's nothing for me to change as far as my spiritual relationship with God is concerned. And the opposite of that, sometimes when people experience trouble and great you know, suffering in life, they think and say to themselves, perhaps I'm not in the right path. This is why we need to practice discernment. David, when he was discouraged, he decides to go with the enemy. The enemy provides protection. And no longer was he bothered by Saul. So he begins to think that he was in the right path. And so what does David say to Ashish? Let's read what it says in 5 to 7. Then David said to Ashish, I have found, if I have found, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, and I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Ashish gave him Ziklag that day. There were Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah this to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And so because David believed that he was in the right path, what eventually happened to him? What happened to his loyalties and allegiance? You notice that he says, if I have found favor in your eyes, and he uses the terms your servant, and so it begins to, to have what begins what's beginning to happen to David is a shift in loyalties. Before he was seeking favor in whose eyes? Yeah, was. Now he's seeking favor in whose eyes? The eyes of the enemy, Ashish. And so he calls himself the servant of Ashish. And so, because of this, what is he asking for? He's asking to live in the town instead of the royal city. And Ashish decides to give him what he's asking for. And so he gives him the place called Ziklag. And so in Ziklag, he sets up his base. And so this is where David, his 600 men together with him, dwelled for some time. And because they dwelled there, and they had their own town, they were becoming comfortable living in enemy territory. And so you can already sense a spiritual decline in David and his men. And this spiritual decline took place for one full year and four months. David and his men lived with the enemy instead of solidifying and edifying his relationship with Yahuwah, he set up a new covenant with the enemy of Yahuwah because he established a relationship of Lord and vassal supporting the, term, the terms of the covenant they made. David pledged loyalty to Ashish if Ashish is to give him protection and also give him P.F. Dumb. So David focused on his relationship with Ashish rather than his relationship with Yahuwah. These are early signs of spiritual decline and deterioration. When our relationships with Yahuwah is no longer foundational, when it's no longer priority in our life, then it's a sign of spiritual decline. Even if you are progressing in terms of material wealth or earthly success, if one's relationship with Yahuwah begins to decline, you know that you are headed towards a path of destruction. And so this is what was happening to David. It was already deteriorating. 
And because of this, what kind of actions would David engage in? Let's read 27 verse 8. David and his men spent their time raiding the Jeshurites, the Gersites, and the Amalekites, people who had lived near shore toward the land of Egypt since ancient times. So what did David and his men spend their time doing? Not in things that are noble and good and approved by Yahuwah. What did he do? He began raiding. Do you know what it means to raid? It means to strip people's possessions and leave them for dead. And so raiding involved not just taking things, but killing. And so he, they were spending their time killing people and stealing things from them. And so they were spending time breaking the commandments of Yahuwah. Is that a good thing? Absolutely not. This was a terrible period in David's life because he was raiding the Jeshurites, the Gersites, and the Amalekites. Of course, the Jeshurites, the Gersites, and the Amalekites, these were the enemy, the enemies of Israel. And because he was attacking the enemy of Israel in, instead of Israel itself, perhaps there was still a remnant of loyalty that David had for Yahuwah. Now, when he killed or when he raided these places, what did he also do? Let's read verse 9. David did not leave one person alive in the villages he attacked. This is a very different David from what we are used to. Perhaps some of us are disappointed. This is David, the man after God's own heart, right? This is David, the hero of faith. He's killing people. David did not leave one person alive in the villages he attacked. He took the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels, and clothing before returning home to see King. Ashish, uh, do you see how decline can lead to great deterioration of one's spiritual life? Verse 10, where did you make your raid today? Ashish would ask. And David would reply against the south of Judah, the Jeramilites and the Kenites. And so when Ashish confronts David and asks him, what, where did you make your raid today? What was his answer? He said, well, we raided the south of Judah, the, Jeram the Jeramilites and the Kenites. Now, was David speaking the truth? Did he attack his fellow men, his fellow Israelites? No, he didn't go that far. There were still boundaries that he could not cross. He did not dare attack his own people. He did not do that. He attacked the enemies of Israel. But of course, he would not say that to King Hashish. So David pretended that he attacked the tribe of Judah. David lied on purpose to Hashish to win the confidence of the Philistines and to persuade them that he was a true and loyal Subject. He had no choice. You see, when a person lives in sin, when a person acts in sin to cover up for that sin, you're forced to sin some more. And so this is David living in enemy territory. Now, how did David make sure that he would get away with his scheme? Because he's lying. I mean, don't you think eventually a sheesh is going to find out, right? But there's one thing David did to make sure Ashish would never find out. You know what he did? In verse 11, uh, no one was left alive to come to Gath and tell where he had really been. This happened again and again while he was living among the Philistines. And so to ensure that his scheme would not be exposed, David left no one alive. And so when he went on raids, he killed all of them. And he did this again and again. And so he was not bothered with the killing, with the raiding, and it became a pattern of sin. He was not bothered by the raiding and the killing. And he even added deception and lying. And so what he did was establish a pattern of sin. Beloved brethren, in our life, when we begin to establish a pattern of sin, it becomes a root. And when it becomes a root or a pattern of sin, 
it's going to come back in our life. There'll be time when we're going to overcome it, but eventually it's going to go back to it. It's like an old habit that doesn't die. Sometimes you overcome it, but that old habit has a way of rearing its ugly head, especially in times of discouragement. I mean, we would see this happen again in the life of David later on. Remember when? I mean, when was the famous incident of David where he had to murder, adult, commit adultery, and commit deception? When was that? His infamous sin involving who? Bathsheba and Uriah. You see, what was established before during his time, his period of great discouragement and great doubt and decline, it emerged again when he fell in love with Bathsheba. And so when we are aware of a specific pattern of sin in our life, we need to address that. We need to remove it from the roots. Because if not, it's going to come back, come back and haunt us again and again and again. So we need to ask the Father's help. It's a good thing what we have today that David did not have is the empowering of the Holy Spirit through Christ Yahushua. And so we have power over sin. It doesn't matter what sin or established pattern of sin we had over the years. We can remove all of that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so because of our union with Yahusha, we really have no excuse. We can remove the root of sin and pattern of sin in our life. And so because of this, well, Ashish believed David and thought to himself, by now the people of Israel must hate him bitterly. Now he will have to stay here and serve me. Forever. And so Ashish is pleased. He's happy. He believes David because he thinks David is attacking his own countrymen. Of course, David was lying. But Ashish was proud. He was happy with what he had with David and his men. He's going to serve me now. He's going to work for me. And so because he had this idea that he's going to work for him, what does he decide to do? About that time, the Philistines mustered their armies for another war with Israel. King Ashish told David, you and your men will be expected to join me in battle. This was a big test for David, right? What do you think David said? What do you think he says to Ashish? I mean, does he come out of his stupor? Does he come out of the state of spiritual decline? What does he say? Let's read verse 2. So David said to Ashish, surely you know. What your servant can do. And as she said to David. Therefore I will make you. One of my chief guardians. Forever. And so David. It seemingly with great pride. Says to Ashish. And assures Ashish. I'm going to fight. Right by your side. You know what your servant can do. And so this is really a sad period. In David's life. I think this is like the bottom. This is like the bottom of the bottom. That episode of uh, adultery and murder and cover up with Uriah. So those are like two periods in David's life that we can say was he was at his lowest. So David was not a perfect man. But what we need to gain in this study of First Samuel 27, 28 is this lesson. You see, when you live with the enemy, you become like the enemy and eventually fight for the enemy. Beloved brethren, we live in the world. The world is God's enemy. And so living in the world, we need to understand and make discernment concerning the values that we adopt in our life. Do not adopt the world's values. Because when we adopt the world's values, guess what? We become like the world. And when we become like the world, we will fight for the world. And we're going to fight against who? The word of God. We're going to fight against Yahuwah Him. So, and there are many, many people today who, because of the values that they have adopted from the world, they have become the enemies of God. They no longer believe the Bible. They reject spiritual spirituality. They reject Christianity. They no longer believe. They become agnostics. Some believe all religions are true. And so they begin to adopt the thinking of the world. And in so doing, they become the enemy of God. And so we don't want this to happen to us. And what we see with David is, you know, he was discouraged. He became desperate. And in his desperation, he experienced spiritual decline. 
and deter deterioration. And how long that David was in this period of spiritual decline and deterioration. If you still remember 27.7, now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. So spiritual decline and de deterioration, it lasted for one year and four months. We call this backsliding. You know, it's a common experience for many followers of God, followers of Yahushua. Sometimes they will enter a period in their life when they were they will backslide from the faith, when they will live in apostasy, right? And I think if we're going to be honest with ourselves, sometimes we're guilty of that. There were times when we are in a spiritual high, but sometimes just like David, because we're human beings, we could go on a decline. And this decline can go on for a long, long time. Like David, this is for one year and four months. Well, why one year and four months? Because after one year and four months, what happens to Saul? He dies. So after the death of Saul, that's when he begins to repent and return to Yahweh. But for one year and four months, he was in a state of spiritual decline and deterioration. And it turns out there's no evidence whatsoever that during this period of time that David ever writes a psalm. He, de he doesn't write a prayer. He doesn't write song. There's no psalm written concerning this period of David's life. Why? Because he's so far away from who? Yahweh. There was a spiritual decline and deterioration. Now, if spiritual decline and deterioration can happen to David, do you know what that means? If it can happen to David, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to us. We should never think, I will never fall. I will never suffer spiritual deterioration or decline. I will never go into apostasy. It happened to one of the greatest men of God, David, of whom Yahuwah said, Amen, after my own. Or if it can happen to him, it can also happen to us. Which is why we need to ask the question, well, how could this happen to someone like David in the first place? Well, if we look at how it all, how this eventually happened, it began when he was discouraged. In his discouragement, he became desperate. And when you're desperate, you take desperate actions. He takes the action of living with the enemy, finding refuge in Ashish, king of Gath, and in so doing, he experiences decline and deterioration. And so we need to look at how he was discouraged in the first place and figure out a way so that we can learn from this so that we can prevent ourselves from becoming discouraged to the point of spiritual decline. We know that David was physically emotionally and spiritually exhausted. Why? Because he was being hunted down by Saul and his men. And on many occasions, he was almost successful, right? And so when this is happening to you, I mean, if you're exposed to threats of death, it's not an easy thing. I mean, even if one, speaking from experience, if an individual has been sued for example you have a legal case the stress can get to you you know and when you have threats of death and you are forced to leave your comfort zone and go to a place you're not familiar with where you are not you're not able to access easily the things that you need in life to survive like food and water protection shelf and, uh, and clothing you're going to be exhausted, right? If it's happening again and again and again, you will be physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. And so when we feel exhausted, when we feel tired, we need to ask for help. We need to ask for help. Do not say I'm mad enough to do it. David was tired. He needed help. Don't be afraid to ask you know, someone you trust for help because we all need that help. But you know what? 
it wasn't just the physical, emotional, and spiritual tolls of what he was going through that caused him to become desperate and discouraged. What was it? If you still remember, verse 1, but David kept thinking to himself, someday Saul is going to get me. You see, it was not the external conditions that caused him to become discouraged. It was what he was thinking that caused him to become discouraged. Yes, the trigger was what is happening outside of him, but what directly caused his discouragement was what he was thinking to himself. What did he think to himself? What did he say to himself again and again? Someday, Saul is going to get me. And so when you keep repeating that thought in your mind, what are you going to feel? Discouraged. You're going to be discouraged. And when you're discouraged, you're going to become desperate. And so what we have here with David and what we face just like David and the other great men of God as human beings who have a brain and a mind and who are exposed to many problems in life, all of us from time to time, we're going to deal with the problem of ants. What do you mean by ants? And this is a common problem that we all face, whether we like it or not. We face this problem every day. Did you know that? And if we don't know how to properly deal with ants, it's going to destroy us. What are ants? Automatic negative thoughts and hence it's reality i mean according to the national science foundation an average person has about twelve thousand to sixty thousand thoughts per day of those sixty thousand thoughts 80 percent are negative and 95 percent are repetitive thoughts if we repeat those negative thoughts we think negative way uh, if we think negative way more than we think positive thoughts. And so if you're repeating negative thoughts in your mind, which is coming at you automatically, this is not something you're controlling, you know? It just happens. You're just thinking it, and you did not do it intentionally. That's why it's called automatic. Automatic means not intentional. And so automatic thoughts happen all the time in our minds. And 80% of these thoughts that happen in our mind without our per our intent happen to be negative and repetitive. Repetitive negative thoughts in our minds produces a trance. A hypnotic trance that makes you maybe depressed and anxious and worried and you feel discouraged and desperate. This is what was happening to David. I mean, what was the negative thought that he was repeating in his mind? What was it? Right, someday, right, David kept thinking to himself, someday Saul is going to get me. Of course, if you're going to repeat that thought again and again and every single day, you're going to be affected by that. You're going to become discouraged. You're, you're going to become desperate. And so we have to learn how to deal with the problem of automatic negative thought patterns because it can affect our mind and this can affect if we don't deal with it properly, even our faith. And so what are examples of negative thought patterns? There are many kinds of automatic negative thought patterns, but two that are probably very relevant to David and are probably relevant to us all is catastrophizing and discounting the positive. What is catastrophizing? This is when you make small problems into big problems or worst case scenarios. You assume that the worst is going to happen. That's catastrophizing. Discounting the positive. It means you identify the negatives in positive situations or events or turning positive results into negative ones. Sometimes we're so biased about someone or something or some circumstance or some event, we can only see the negative. We cannot see the positive, right? And so, for example, you lose your job. What are the automatic negative thoughts that pop, that pop up in your mind? There's this, mind? there's this voice in your head that says, you are worthless. You will never be hired again. You're going to end up on the street with no means of supporting yourself. So these are automatic negative thoughts that's going to happen, that's going to penetrate your mind, 
and attack you again and again and again. If you don't deal with it, what's going to happen to you? You're going to become discouraged. You're going to become desperate and you're going to decline. And so how can we deal with ants? Well, the first thing we need to do is identify the ant. Identify the negative thought. Because when we identify the negative thought, when we realize, you know, this is a, an automatic thought that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It's just an automatic thought. Because just because it's a thought in your mind, it doesn't mean it's true. Okay? So we need to identify the end. For example, with, with David, what kind of negative thinking was he applying? It was catastrophizing. Right? Catastrophizing is a thought pattern that involves anticipating the worst possible outcome of an event or situation. Maybe, let's say, for example, that we lost our job. And so what is catastrophizing when you lose your job? I'm never going to find a job again, or I'm going to end up on the streets, and I'm going to be homeless. My family is going to be messed up. They're going to hate me forever. I'm going to hate my life forever. And so you're catastrophizing an automatic negative thought. And so what we need to do when we have negative thoughts, put them down. These are my thoughts. What are your negative thoughts? Write them down. Identify them. Because when you identify negative thoughts, it loses its power over you. Okay? What's number two? We need to challenge the negative thought. Because just, be just because it's a thought in your mind doesn't mean it's true. There are many thoughts that are not true. Most thoughts in your mind are not true. And so when we have a negative thought in our mind, we need to challenge that thought. We challenge the negative thought by looking for evidence or examining the facts of the situation. In other words, we test it. For example, when David says, someday Saul is going to get me. And so when you examine that thought, when you examine what has happened to David's life, what do you realize? I mean, if David was being realistic in his thinking, if he was being balanced in his thinking, because at this point, I mean, how many times has Saul tried to kill him? How many times? One, two, three, four, five, six, at least six. More than that. I mean, if he's tried to kill you so many times, the tendency is to look at the negative. You're being, you, you are, he's been trying to kill you. And eventually he's going to get me, right? So he's focusing on the negative, but do you see the positive in it? What's the positive in Saul's negative thinking? What's the positive? Huh? Has he ever been caught? Has he ever been killed? No. Every single time, Yahuwah has delivered David from Saul without fail. In fact, he even delivered Saul into his hands. I mean, when you think about this thought that eventually Saul's going to get catch me or get me and test it with evidence from what has happened in your life, the evidence tells us he's never going to catch you, David, because Yahweh was protecting you. <laughs> and so one of the things that we can practice is keep a record of how Yahuwah has delivered us in our life. If I were to ask you, Name the last three moments. I'm not asking for a comprehensive list. But the last three times that you know Yahuwah delivered you. And Yahuwah blessed you. And Yahuwah protected you. Can you give me examples of that? You see, we need to be aware of how Yahuwah has been faithful to us. So when we face situations which causes a trigger of any automatic negative thoughts, we know we can go back. And review our life with Yahweh. He has been faithful to us. So challenge that negative thought. Replace that negative thought. Best way to get rid of a negative thought is not by thinking. It's not by telling someone, don't think about it. I mean, if someone is thinking to himself, I'm worthless. And you tell them, stop thinking that you're worthless. It's not an easy thing to do. If you tell someone... You know, okay, don't think of a pink elephant. What's the person going to do? 
is going to think of a pink elephant, right? Why? Because it's very difficult not to think of of something. Of a negative, if you have a negative thought, if the more someone tells you stop thinking about it, the more you think about it. And so the best thing to do when you identify the negative thought, you challenge the negative thought, is to replace the negative thought with a positive thought. And so what is that negative thought? Find a promise from Yahuwah. Find the word of God. Find an experience that you've had with Yahuwah that you know counteracts that negative thought. And so Philippians 4, 8 tells us, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, are a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Apostle Paul is telling us, meditate on the word of God. Because when we meditate on the word of God, when our mind is filled with the, the word of God, if we memorize scripture, you memorize a verse a week, for example, and you understand scripture, you have a collection of scriptures, a list of your favorite scriptural verses that speak to you, that speak to the problems you face. Guess what? You're going to create a voice in your head. You're going to create a thought in your head that will replace the negative thoughts. You see, this is important because every voice that you consistently listen to and agree with will shape your identity. You become who you listen to the most. You are transformed by the voice you accept. Carefully consider what voice you were listening to and how it is transforming you. And so what are we listening to? Our negative thoughts or the thoughts of Yahweh about us? Or the, the words of God that are empowering and powerful. And so we need to immerse our mind with the word of God. When we immerse our mind with the word of God, the voice that you're going to hear is whose voice? The voice of Yahuwah. And when you hear the voice of Yahuwah, he will change your identity. He will transform. To overcome whatever it is that you're facing with. And so that's the power of memorizing scriptures. And when we memorize scriptures, when we know Yahuwah has the power to turn our life around, to turn our circumstances around, then we have replaced anxiety with peace. However, there are two scriptures that I want you to believe in. And memorize so that this can replace a lot of the negative thinking that we are facing and dealing with in our life. Just two scriptures I want you to begin memorizing for this week. Number one is Roman, Romans 8.28. How many here are familiar with Romans 8.28? It goes something like this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I mean, how many of us can identify like negative events in our life? And at the time when we were living during those negative events, we thought to ourselves, this is the end of the world. But then after a couple of years, when we go back, what do we realize? Yahuwah God used that as instruments and caused it to work together for good. And so whatever we're dealing with, ask ourselves, has Yahuwah failed us before? He's not going to fail us now. Whatever situation you are in, if you give it to God, he's going to cause everything to work together for our good. Believe that. That's number one. What's number two? The last passage of our studies. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God. For he cares about you in his kindness. God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Yahusha. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. God causes all things together for good. But the crucial element of that scripture is the right time. You get it? There's always the right time for everything. 
And the Bible says, when we are facing a difficult situation, allow Yahuwah to cause that suffering that we need to experience for a little while so that he can use it as an instrument to restore, to support, to strengthen us, and to place us on a firm foundation. If we will give God the time, instead of complaining, we praise him and thank him because we know he is with us no matter what. When we will give him that time, at the right time, what will he do? He's going to restore us. He will lift you up in honor. This is what David was not able to do. Instead of allowing Yahuwah and his mighty power to lift him up in honor at the right time, what did he do? He tried to solve the problem with his own power. Beloved brethren, there is the tendency and the inclination when we feel discouraged to take matters into our, our own hands to the point that we begin to defy the will of Yahuwah. We need to be careful. The best thing to do when we go through difficulties in life is to give our worries and cares to God and wait for the right time because at the right time, he will lift us up in honor. And so brethren, let us immerse ourselves in the wonderful words of our Father Yahweh. Because the word of God, if that's the voice in our head speaking to us, it will transform our life and it will bring us closer to him. That is our lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Father, most holy and gracious Abba Yahuwah, thank you for reminding us about the power of your holy words. May you please teach us to have an automatic response, to trust you, to rely on you, no matter what we face in our life. If we examine our life, we know for sure you have already worked out your plan and your deep purpose for each one of us. Your thoughts about us are more than the grains of sand on the seashore. And so certainly, Father, you thought immensely about our future. We have nothing to worry about nor fear so long as we rely upon you. Father, we surrender to you now. We give our future to your hands. May you please teach us to understand your timing. Teach us to trust you, to be patient. At the same time, we give to you our worries. We give to you our cares. Yes, from time to time, Father, we have these negative thoughts. We begin to think negatively about the future. Abba, Yahuwah, please replace our thoughts. Bless us with your thoughts in our minds. Thoughts and words of encouragement that we will grow from our suffering and receive your blessing in our life. We will thank you and praise you no matter what. We will glorify your name, Yahuwah. You are faithful to your people, always present in times of need. Yahusha, the living word, you are the fulfillment of every promise. And so we turn to you, gracious King. In you, we find solutions to every problem. You are the source of our strength. You are everything in our life. Walk with us, please. Do not allow us to be by ourselves. Help us to feel your presence that we can be strengthened in our faith. Father, please heal your people of any physical affliction. Heal our souls and our emotions. Give us peace of mind and joy. And may you remember your people, Father, who are praying to you for help. May you answer them and keep them safe. We pray a special prayer to our brethren in the Philippines. The entire nation is under great duress because of the storms ravaging that nation. Oh, Yahuwah Abba, keep them safe, especially our brothers and sisters. May you please watch over us and protect us by your powerful hands. We believe, Father, that you have listened to our prayers. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brethren, thank you so much for attending our Bible study for today.
We do hope that you will join us for our worship services this weekend. That is all. May Yahuwah Abba and Yahushua Mashiach bless all of us.